Next, an interview from Planet Hollywood Hotel and Casino in Las Vegas, the site of Freedom Fest 2013. Paul Skousen joined Book TV to discuss his book, The Naked Socialist. The book completes the trilogy that was started by his father, Cleon Skousen, author of The Naked Communist and The Naked Capitalist. Well, you may have heard of The Naked Communist or The Naked Capitalist, and now Paul Skousen has written The Naked Socialist. Mr. Skousen, what's the connection between those three books? Well, it finishes out the trilogy. My father was trying to explain and show and describe the powers that are moving through the world, causing a little bit of grief. He had intended to do one on socialism, but he died before he could finish. So I went ahead and did that for him. It's, it's a great name. Cecil B. DeMille gave us the name. He said, he said Cleon, you've stripped communism of its, all of its fakery, its lies, its fraud. And he ought to call it Naked Communist. So he did. And who, followed that up. Who was your father? My father is Cle W. Cleon Skousen, former FBI and chief of police of Salt Lake and prolific author, writer. Uh, the Naked Communist was a national bestseller. The Naked Capitalist was a national bestseller, each going over a million copies. That says a lot in the 1950s. So, so why The Naked Socialist? There's an underpinning force at work that wasn't described and fleshed out in the other books and that's what I did. Socialism is more than a political party, it's more than just a name we call people we disagree with, it's, it's, it's a, a word that's fairly modern but it rests upon seven really bad ideas and these ideas are as old as humanity. We just happen to call it socialism nowadays. What are those seven pillars of socialism that you list in your book? There we go, right from the book. We've got uh, the, the first one is an all-powerful ruler. Uh, as I went down and studied social societies and cultures, I found these seven common ideas. All-powerful ruler, that can be a group or an individual. The second one is uh, society ends up being divided into classes. There's always an elitist class those that get all the favors out of the rulers and all the help and the money and permissions and all of that. That was the second characteristic. The third one I found was the rulers promise things in common. We're going to make it fair and help out, take from the haves and give to the have-nots. Uh, the fourth one after that is to achieve fairness. We must regulate all things from the top. And all of these powers and forces do that. So regulation is number four. And number five, this is done with force. You comply or you're dead. And 6,000 years of history, that's always been there, force. And then number six, the control of information. And they tell the lies. They're the only ones that have permission to tell the lies. Everybody else has to speak truth. That's what Plato said. So information control numbers, statistics, the media, slanting things. And then number seven is, there's no such thing as an unalienable right. They tell you what your rights are. It's all vested by the government, your rights. So those seven bad ideas, you, now that you know them, you can look anywhere in history, in the United States now, and you can see which of those are growing. And that's your evidence that socialism is, is here. You don't need to be a political science major. You don't need to be a history major. See those seven markers and you know we've got trouble. Where is the United States with regard to those seven pillars? We are well underway. Our constitution towards socialism. Our constitution has been so ignored and abused and changed and altered by the Supreme Court. There's now a culture in our nation uh, I call it thinking like a socialist. That's what they want us to do. Your first reaction to anything is, well, how can the government solve it for me? That's not how it's supposed to be. Government's role, at least on the federal level, is very limited. Today, that's reversed. So we've got a strong ruling class. Uh, we don't have the kind of control over our senators, for example, that we should as part of our representative government. What do you mean? Well, 17th Amendment. Uh, is what got in the way. The way it was originally set up, I have a tremendous friend, Howard Stevenson. He's a state senator in Utah. Good friend of mine. We've had lunch. We've even gone to church together. He's my state senator. I can go to Howard and I can say, Howard, 
our senator just voted for TARP. And he's been voting to increase government. The guy's out of control. I don't like that. And Howard goes to the legislature and he talks to the others and they say, yeah, we're hearing the same thing. So they get on the phone and they call him up and they say, you're fired. And they take that senator home and send a replacement. Now that can't happen today, but that's how the founders set it up. So today, if I'm mad at my senator, I gotta wait five and a half, six years for the next election. And he can do a whole lot more damage during that time frame. So the 17th Amendment really did destroy and cut our representative government. At, at the direct election of senators? The, to the direct election of senators, right. And so that's one of the movements towards a strong top government that socialism contains. Well, in chapter 57, Revolutionary Bad Amendments is the name of the chapter. And you say bad points in the 14th Amendment. What are some of those bad points in the 14th? Now we need to go to my cheat notes. <laughs> we've, we've got so many good intentions and when they violate correct principle, um, uh, then our country starts wheeling off into areas that create more problems down the road. Uh, one of them that I mentioned there is about citizenship. All you have to do is have a, you know, be here long enough to have a baby and that baby can become a citizen. Uh, that's wreaked all kinds of havoc with our immigration issues and that's what we're fighting and wrestling right now and it's it's unfortunate because good people usually good people with a lot to add want to come to our country but we need a mechanism to to keep those out the, that are gonna hurt our country well how do you do that and that system and process was kind of torn down uh, by that but isn't uh, the 14th Amendment known as the Due Process, one of the Due Process Amendments? So... <laughs> Just asking, okay. a, lot of people, a lot of people are in favor of the 14th yeah. Amendment. Okay, correct. And, and it was used to end slavery, was it not? Right, it was used to end slavery. So there's good parts. And so I list what those good parts are, but at the same time, it was a very poorly written amendment and we need to go back and revisit it and take care of some of these negatives because yes, ending slavery, very positive, we like that. Uh, unequal protection was injected into, into our government with the 14th. States are meant to protect uh, their citizens and the 14th Amendment takes that away. It says, 14th Amendment says, we can tax you at whatever rate we want. And the states say, no you can't. We want it to be the same for all our people. And the federal says, sorry. So these inequities were put in there. And, and yes, it's a big discussion. And yes, it's complicated. That's why I tried to clarify some of those points here in the book. So Paul, Paul Skousen, you go back several thousand years. What is this chapter? Right, Sparta, the warrior socialists. Once you have these seven pillars of socialism in your mind and can see how that works. You can go into history and you can say, look at this, they were doing it back then. Nothing has changed. So in, I go all the way back to, to ancient Sumer and Egypt, ancient China, ancient India, I get into to ancient Greece. And so here you have uh, the society, the Spartans built on uh, warriors and taking boys from their parents at this young age, seven or eight years old, and sending them into military training. For what purpose? To eventually rise up and be a warrior. So the whole society is destructive to the family, destructive to their culture. You know how they graduated? The slave population there among the Spartans, they called the Helots. And you would graduate at once every year, usually in the fall time, they would take their 18-year-old warriors and they would say, go out and find a Helot, somebody who's causing problems, and kill him at your graduation. See if you can sneak up on him and take him out. And here's a list of the most undesirables. So, once again, the seven pillars appearing all throughout ancient history. So there's nothing new in socialism. Part 14, and this is uh, how many pages? 600 or so? 500 it's some? 500 of the good stuff and then appendix. <laughs> Part 14, Socialism Today in America. This is the quote that you open with. 
It is impossible to introduce into society a greater change and a greater evil than this, the conversion of the law into an instrument of plunder. Right. Isn't that a great quote? Frederick Bastiat. Um, what he was trying to get at is, is the primary goal of, of socialism, exactly that right there, to allow the, the hammer, the iron fist of the government, to impose its will uncontrollably on all the rest of us. And that's the beauty of the Constitution, is it didn't allow that to happen. It chained it down. The founders were no dummies. They knew this stuff was going on all the time. So now the government has said, well, for us to serve you, we need money. So we're going to have to get it somehow. And so they do that through now, the income tax, graduated income tax. They, they do it through all kinds of means and try to justify their existence to oppress the prosperity that should otherwise grow. So once again, this whole sad scenario has unfolded. We've got to turn it around. Who is Frederick Bastiat? Frederick Bastiat, he was one of the best thinkers and a great writer, and I wished I could be as good as that man was. And he, he actually wrote quite a bit, he wrote a really great book called The Law, and it's a short read, everybody should read it. And he just explains these basic principles of freedom, and he was back in the 1800s. What's your background? My background is I was a... Uh, well, I worked for the CIA for a while, and so doing, doing what? I was an intel. I was a military analyst, and then I moved into their their operations center and became an intelligence officer. And that was a, a 24/7 watching the world. And if something happened, you would tell whoever needed to know. And then at the White House, that same position opened up in the Situation Room. So I applied, and I went over there for two and a half years. President Reagan. During President Reagan, started his second term, and. And that's actually what keyed me into something's wrong. That's what started me on my study of socialism. Reagan's hands were tied. And this, this thinking like a socialist had infected his closest advisors. And I could watch him. I had a peephole. And I could spy. I don't know if you're supposed to, but I did. the conference room had two sliding wooden doors. And we in the situation room, if we had to give a message or let someone in, We'd look through a peephole and see them. And I used to sit there and lean against the door and watch President Reagan. And I thought, you know, why aren't you leading? You know, you're our great dynamic president telling these people what they're supposed to do. And then I came to realize this brilliant strategist was having to fight fire with fire because some of his own people were viewing America's problems and solutions in terms of bigger government thinking like a socialist. That good man fought very hard to get around that, and I admire him completely. Well, in your book on presidents and socialism, uh, you take on Richard Nixon. Inflated regulatory controls is his legacy, according to you. Yeah. <laughs> that was a real challenge. <laughs> When, when a, a president gets the power, what are they going to do with it? Are they going to stay within constitutional bounds, or are they going to use the loose interpretations to perpetuate and, and build their own legacies? And, and, and just about every president did. It wasn't very often I could find a president that actually tried to shrink the government. Nixon tried to inflate it. Everybody was using it. You know what shocked me was Jimmy Carter. I didn't like Jimmy Carter. Who likes Jimmy Carter? I mean, there's some real problems with him. He's a good man in his heart. And I started to look into his legacy. He actually wanted to shrink government. At the time, I guess I was, you know, I was in, in college. I was too young to appreciate what he was saying. He wanted to shrink government. We should have all supported that. But his own party, his own Democratic Party came out against him. And, and what was it? It was 19, as I remember, uh, things he told the... Democratic Party, if I'm going to automatically veto these, his Democratic Party turned against him. They wanted to grow government. Carter tried to shrink it. Who would have thought? So aside from all the things we're mad at him for, we should be very grateful that his attitude was that. So not a great difference between Republicans and Democrats? Not today. Uh, the Republicans are trying to enlarge government because that's the answer to power. You know, 
tax, tax, vote, vote, spend, spend. That seems to be the pattern. So the Republicans are adopting that. Mitt Romney, I think, tried to stop that. He tried to say, look, we have to cut back. And that scared people. One of the devious uh, tools of, of this socialist mentality is to make people dependent upon government. And once you're dependent, you know, I, when we retire, who's going to pay the bills? We're going to look forward to Medicare. We're going to look forward to uh, not national health care, but the government saving us and helping us. Well, if a politician comes up and says, I'm going to have to turn that off, sorry, that's the way it goes, that scares people. That's what thinking like a socialist leads to. And so letting it start was the big mistake. Paul Skousen, we've discussed a little bit of the naked socialist. How does it compare to the naked ca uh, communist or the naked capitalist? Yeah, the naked communist takes you from Karl Marx up through the establishment and growth of communism. And my father treated that as kind of a history book of that particular movement. Similar elements, how it creeps into our culture and starts to get you thinking uh, like a socialist. What I tried to do is get under that and say, why? Why is that so insidious and evil? Um, naked, ca naked Capitalist was a look at how the money was socialized. The, I love Margaret Thatcher's quote, which is taken out of context and it's combined a little bit, but she says, socialism works until they run out of other people's money. And I love that. Um, so how do you get other people's money? And that's what The Naked Capitalist is about. It's, it's a book review. Carol Quigley's book, Tragedy and Hope, and it's a big fat book, 11, 1200 pages or something. And Carol Quigley explains and shows how central banking gradually unfolded in our society and eventually put countries into debt. Uh, I was just adding this up a while ago. All the countries in the world have these private central banks controlling their money. How much money? are they in debt to 75 trillion dollars worldwide and for that they're paying all of us are paying billions and billions every single month in interest it's because it's a private institution alexander hamilton had that idea in the constitutional convention the other founders laughed him out of the room he got mad and went home and only showed up two or three times during during the development of the constitution so today, that's a, an enormous problem that's weighing down the whole world. And the Naked Capitalist explains those details by reviewing and excerpting long quotes so people could not accuse my father of selective quotations. Uh, long quotes from Carol Quigley's book that explains how central banking is hurting us. Chapter 56, Revolutionary Top 10 Books. Some of the books that you... Uh, say are on this list include The Republic by Plato and Peach Blossom Spring by Tao Yan Ming, Utopia written by Thomas More, and The Jungle by Upton Sinclair. Why are those books socialist? They all follow the same pattern. If we violate principles for the good of the whole, we can have great harmony in our societies. And look how nice things will be if we'll just cooperate together. If we were robots, that would work great, but we're not. And the Founding Fathers understood that. And so in each of these attempts to, to paint our society, the solution is always strong government. They don't consider freedom or individual action. And that's the reason the jungle and some of these others are in there. Yes, there needs to be a cooperative, but the founders said, very minimal at the top, let the local levels handle it. Much wiser, people that are directly impacted, let them handle these problems. Is this self-published? It is, yeah. Why? Um, quicker, a little more control over that. We've been publishing my father's books through Ensign for a long time, and we have our own distribution channels, and, and I didn't even ask anyone if they were interested. We just got it out there. So much information. We need to develop a curriculum for the people of this nation that they can read and understand and get it in their hands because things are going to get worse and hard. Why? Uh, we're on a downward slope. 
socialism is interesting. It's it, it's it's a slope down to bankruptcy. The history section in this book, I show how cultures collapse. They always collapse. Socialism just doesn't build. It doesn't create. It consumes. So people are born somewhere up here and they die somewhere down here and they say, yeah, socialism. Well, you know, we got problems. Someone's born here and they die down here. Well, yeah, things need help. It's that way all the way down. I have friends from England and Europe. They'll stop by or at my book signings and they'll say, I lived in socialism over in England or Germany. It worked fine. Well, another friend came home from England. I says, tell me about their health system. And he said, oh, it's horrible. Yes, you can go into any hospital and get help right away, but but it's dirty. You got to wait for months at a time if it's major, and they're making mistakes. Well, don't they have anything like America? Yes, they do. In the private health care sector in England, what are their hospitals like? Ours? Can you get an MRI that day? <laughs> so you have this beautiful example of this slope of socialism. People say, yeah, it's not perfect. And on the other hand, this wonderful free enterprise, free market, profit-driven system that offers so much more. So there's a lot of hope in getting back to our basic principles. Where does President Obama, in your view, fit? Yeah, he's, he's a big government man. And people ask me, is he a socialist? And I say, well, that depends on your definition of socialism. And this is the definition that, that I always use. It's government force to control or change society. And Obama is right, President Obama is right there trying to control and change society. The Founding Fathers developed and built the Constitution so that couldn't happen. That individual is supposed to be a temp. We hired him to go ahead and help guide and direct our country, not to change it. So, government force to control and change society. So yes, it, under that definition, Obama is definitely a socialist. If he hasn't declared himself a member of that party, whatever, I love the proverb, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And that's where a lot of people are. How's it selling? Uh, it's doing really well. It's, it's available as, as a download on Kindle. There's a lot of Kindles, but Amazon.com is the place to go. So it's doing very well. Now you have a previous book that we want to show our viewers as well. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, Comrade Paul's Socialist Bathroom Reader. In my research, uh, and as I looked into these different countries, those poor oppressed people had a sense of humor. And I guess that was their break from the tension of having to go through this idiocy uh, for decades. So I gathered that information plus other little tidbits and things and brought them all together as a collective of commie comedy. Um, I'll give you just one. Comrade Husak. He's addressing the Communist Party and he says, Comrades, in 1968 we were standing on the edge of the abyss. Since then, we have taken a significant step forward. <laughs> Just, and that, that's a true. That's true. That's a real joke, and they and they have follow-on jokes about why is capitalism on the edge of the deep abyss, and the answer is so they can see us socialists better. <laughs> Wonderful sense of humor. I put in uh, socialist world records. You know which socialist has the best facial hair. You know that seems to be a big deal with socialists. Which socialist has the most murders and deaths laying at his feet? Not very funny. Who wins that one? That Mao wins that one. He's, he's up around 75, 76 million. And the Soviet Union itself comes in second at 60 million. It's just horrific. And people look at that and say, well, yeah, that was over there. But how quickly it came because of those seven bad ideas people allowed to grow up in their midst. We've been talking with author Paul Skousen about his most recent book, The Naked Socialist. He's also the author of Comrade Paul's Socialist Bathroom Reader. Here are the books. You're watching Book TV on C-SPAN 2.